Namaste, and welcome again to our series on Uladu Narpadu, 40 Verses on Reality, by Sri Ramana Maharshi. And today we're going to look at verse number two, which is very interesting. <laughs> All religions postulate three fundamentals, the world, the soul, and God. But these three are only manifestations of the one reality. One can say the three are really three, only so long as the ego lasts. Therefore, to transcend the ego and remain in one's own being is the perfect state. Well, this is another wonderful verse. Oh, they're all wonderful. <laughs> what can I say? But... Uh, last time we talked about the world and the unreality of the world because the world is impermanent and it doesn't have real existence. Its existence is only derivative of some prior cause. And because of this, it can't be accepted as absolutely real. Nevertheless, most people see the world as a world. They see it as permanent and real. And why is that? Well, because the nature of the seer is similar to the nature of the seen. In other words, if the world is illusory, if it's just temporary and relative and so on, then what kind of being does it require to see that unreality as real? See what I'm getting at? The ego, or what most people accept as their self, is just as unreal as the world. <laughs> and it has to be that way. It has to be because... <laughs> Only an unreal seer would see an unreal world as being real. But these are the, uh, the triad, uh, the inescapable uh, result of being an illusion or being attached to illusory being, being in the world. One of our first video series way back five years ago or so was called Being in the World. And it goes into this from the standpoint of existentialism. Now, existentialism is very interesting because it's based on experience, uh, phenomenology, or observation of one's own experience. And this is very close to the principle of meditation advocated by Ramana, to look into one's own self, one's own consciousness, and say, where does this I arise from? Where does this mind, where does these thoughts come from? Where do they uh, originate? And by looking into that one thought, I am, one can transcend it. But what you see when you first look at the self, you think, oh, this is me. This is I, Mr. So-and-so. Huh? And I have this uh, designation on my job or in my community. I am a this, I am a that. <laughs> I am somebody's husband or somebody's wife or somebody's girlfriend or boyfriend. I am the owner of this property and that car and this thing and that thing, uh, isn't it? That's how we think when we're naive, when we don't know anything about spiritual life or the philosophy of reality. But the more we look into this, the more we meditate on this I am, huh? I am this, I am that, I am so and so, I am such and such, we start to see that this is actually just an illusion. It's actually just words. 
and we're attached to those words, and we think those words are real. In other words, that words are things, or that symbols are reality. How many remember when you graduated from school? Uh, remember, you got to put on a funny hat <laughs> and walk down the aisle and then say a bunch of silly words. And then you got this piece of paper that says, now you're a graduate. Yay, everybody throws their hats up in the air. <laughs> remember how you felt? It was something, wasn't it? Huh? It was a thing. Now I am a graduate and I can put these letters after my name and this is who I am. But actually, who you are has nothing to do with that. Nothing to do with it whatsoever. It's only because we accept the mind as real. We accept thoughts as real. We accept words and symbols as being real. Therefore, we also accept the world as being real. Even though the world that we perceive is mostly just words and symbols, names and forms. So if we're going to attain emancipation, freedom, liberation, moksha, whatever you want to call it, we have to look into this. So as we mentioned, the triad, which is accepted by almost all schools of thought, certainly by all religions and all spiritual paths, with the exception of a very few, is the world, the soul, and God. Huh? So we, we went deeply into the unreality of the world last time. Well, but what about the soul? Isn't the soul real? Isn't it eternal? Isn't it the source of consciousness and so on? Isn't it actually the source of life and so on and so on? The Vedas go into this uh, in great detail, how the soul arises and how it's eternal, even though it comes into being or into the world at a certain point. Uh, it's actually eternal and so on and so on and so on. And if you really think about all of these ideas, they don't add up. They don't make sense. If the soul is eternal without beginning, then why does it come into the world at a certain point in time? Why is there a beginning to life? If the soul was eternal, then life would also be eternal. Consciousness would also be eternal. But we see that this is not so. Consciousness of something only lasts as long as that phenomenon lasts or as long as our attention lasts. And then we get interested in something else or that thing ends and that consciousness is finished. Or some theories are that the soul lives in the heavens or with God in full knowledge, and then at a certain point falls down into material existence. Well, if the soul is in full knowledge, then why does it fall down? How is that possible? And then there's a bunch of hand waving and mumbo jumbo to explain how that happens, but it's not very satisfying. It's not simple, it's not direct. So by Occam's razor, it's not true. Occam's razor, by the way, is the principle of logical deduction that says if there are two explanations for something, the simpler is probably more true. So what is the simple explanation? Well, the simple explanation is that the soul is part of the world and that it has a similar origin. Now, we mentioned God. God is the third member of the triad. And God gets the blame for everything, doesn't he? <laughs> God is the prime cause. He's the beginning of everything. He starts everything going. He's the creator. And he maintains 
everything, and he creates all the universal laws, the law of karma and so on. Boy, he's a busy man, isn't he? Wow, God, no wonder he's so cross and angry all the time. <laughs> he has so much work to do. So this is actually just a complicated explanation for a very, very simple and uncomplicated situation. Just look at your experience. What is our experience of life? Our experience is that we are aware at all times, but we're only conscious when we have an object for our consciousness. And usually that object is the body, isn't it? When we're in deep sleep, we're not aware of the body. And so we say, I was unconscious. No dreams, no perceptions, no memories. The only thing you know is that you were in deep sleep. And then you come out of it and you're in the world of dreams. And in the world of dreams, you have a body, you have a mind, you have feelings, activities, and so on. But that's also very temporary. And when you come out of that and you wake up, quote unquote, in the real world, <laughs> then again, the body becomes the definition of who I am. So we see everything in relation to the body. We evaluate everything good or bad or whatever in terms of the body, in terms of bodily sensation and so on or the concept of the body, our situational awareness, how are we doing in life? But in order to see this illusory world as being real, that means this awareness of I am the body must also be unreal. And so it is. If awareness is eternal, then this awareness of the body comes and goes consciousness of the body has a beginning and an end. Therefore, it's illusory. So the ego, which is based on the thought, I am the body, or I am, is also illusory. And there's a very simple way that we can prove this to ourselves, which is to trace back this thought, I am, to its source, to its origin. The next time you have a thought, like, this is my camera. Huh? Whose camera is that? Well, it's my camera. Well, who am I? Well, I am. I am. Where does that thought come from? See, I am is, is not just a thought, it's also a sensation, a specific gestalt, hmm? a, a, a combination of thought and feeling, a moment in which we become aware of a whole context, a whole situation. And that context is defined by the thought, I am this body. Find out where that thought originates. And then something very interesting happens. The whole mind disappears. And this is one of the most powerful and beautiful meditations. Now, we're not talking about the words I am in the mind. We're talking about the sensation, the gestalt, I am. Find out the origin of that, not just by thinking about it, but by actually feeling it and tracing it back, tracing back this sensation of I am to its source. And you will have found the source of you. And this is the meditation that Ramana prescribes to almost everyone. How to stop the mind. How to make the illusion of the mind go away. And the next time we'll talk more about this meditation and its effects, and how to get the tremendous benefits that come from it. Om Tat Sat. 
ओम हरि ओम